Firstly, I want to introduce this background by Georgie Sakal. Um, she's an amazing based Melbourne sculptor. And I really want to uh, use this opportunity to um, do shout out to artists in our community who are really doing it tough. Um, and they might much make our life so much more richer. I'm going to start this uh, webinar. Uh, if you go to the run sheet, which is in the email link, um, and I'll be running through these resources and talking to them. Um, so you'll be able to refer to them now and also refer to them in the future. With digital strategy, this format of the course that I'm uh, teaching and that I have taught is aimed at small organisations, small individuals. And the idea is to grab the concepts and the ideas that big organisations, big corporations use and wrap them in a simple way that you can use. Uh, obviously, you don't have the big budgets to implement these uh, as the big corporations would. However, if you think in this way, then you'll be a lot better. So in this construct, because I'm taking a lot of complex ideas um, and distilling them in more of a simplistic way, some of the definitions um, are described loosely, and that's to weave a story of the different concepts put together. Now, if you're interested in any of these specific uh, ideas or concepts, then you can obviously do your own research, or you could do your PhD in something uh, as detailed as this. Um, now, it's really important with digital strategy is to understand that it is a subset of organisational strategy. So if your organisation or if, you, if your campaign has no idea of what you're trying to do, then your digital is just not going to work. Um, digital should always be referencing back. Your digital strategy should always be supporting your organisational strategy. So we're not going to be covering organisational strategy at the moment, we're just uh, obviously going to be focusing on digital strategy. Now, sometimes I'll come across organisations that refuse to get an organisational strategy. It defies common sense, but some people work the way that they work. So in that context, I'll use digital strategy development as a Trojan horse to get the organisation to actually think strategically. So we would wrap that up as we're doing a digital strategy when we're really actually doing an organisational strategy with a digital strategy underneath. Um, and so in that context, we're planning on how to use digital to support the campaign strategy. Now, the thing is, resources are always limited. Even if you've got a multi-million dollar budget, you can't afford to pay for all the TV, you can't afford to pay for all, all the staff to run, whatever. So there's always uh, limited resources. Now, if you're a small organization or an individual, then that makes, that is a far more um, bigger concept. Like you've got no resources. So in that context, if you're thinking smarter, then you're gonna be able to do a whole lot more with what you've, what you've got. Now, the details, that we would go to in this concept, uh, applying these concepts is in the, the, in the con context. So obviously you're not going to apply all these ideas to every campaign, um, even in a simple way. Uh, but what I urge you to do is to start thinking about this when you're framing what you're doing. So you may even refer back to this as a bit of a checklist, like have I thought of it this way? Am I thinking like this, um, et cetera. Um, I had a um, where a, a student come to one of my trainings and had spent 40 grand on his website and I looked at it and went that didn't work did it and he goes no nah, that's why I'm here um, so a bit of thinking at the start would have saved him 40 grand development um, and a very cheap website would have been far more effective now for homework um, or if you've read it already, is this uh, video uh, fighting for attention. Now the summary of that is talking about the big platforms, Google, Facebook, um, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, and how they are fighting for people's limited attention. So there's this big battle going around, uh, going on to try to get people's attention. Now your campaign and what you're trying to do is stuck in the middle of this fight fight between platforms, fight between organizations. Um, so it's a big challenge to even get your, um, your ideas or your messages out there. 
So if you're framing what you're doing, the fact that you're fighting for attention. So for example, even giving away um, free content like I am, which is my commercial courses are like $900, $1,200. Even then it's hard to fight for people's attention because it's so precious. So always treat people's attention as very precious and always um, put your strategy in that context. Like why would they care about looking at you? So I'm going to start with where I always start with any project and that is digital goals. Now this is very interesting because I always ask when I'm working with anyone, what are you trying to do? And that just sounds simple. Now, what, what it's really surprising how many organizations or people don't know what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. Um, I worked with a client last late, late last year and they couldn't tell me what they're trying to achieve with the website. And if I looked at the website, it reflected that. It was messy, I didn't know what to do, it wasn't doing anything that they wanted it to do. So we really need to make sure before we start anything that we actually know what we're trying to achieve. We want it to be as simple as possible. Now, this is key because this becomes now the reference for all of your strategy, all of your debate, spend and focus. So I had a client come to me and go, oh, what do you think about us doing this? And my response was, how does this work to achieve your goals? That is always my answer. Right? What are you spending this on? What time are you doing on this? How is that going to affect or help you achieve your goals? And generally, I don't answer those questions. I let them answer it. It's either clear yes or no. Um, this will dictate all your time, your budget spend, um, it's also really clear for working with people in your organization. So if people, if your organization has conflicting goals, then you need to sort that out. Um, whatever process you usually will do for your, org your internal audience, you need to figure out what your goals are. Um, the debate or any conflict on what you're trying to achieve should be sorted out before you even start simply because if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to know. Um, all right, so I use the analogy of a Swiss army knife versus a bread knife with goals. So some people will have a big, big list and um, conflicting goals. So we're gonna do an exercise um, to just to get an idea of what, what I'm talking about. But in the short term, I want you to think about a Swiss army knife. Are you out camping? You wanna cut a loaf of bread. So you pull out your Swiss army knife, which is really useful. To, doing lots of things and it's designed to do a lot of things uh, but it's really going to hack out your bread and yes it'll work you'll be able to cut your bread however if you've got a bread knife that's the blades actually designed for bread it'll cut it very clean so this is the same thing with your goals if you've got very simple targeted clear goals you'll then be able to do all your strategy and execution that's very targeted and clear if you're trying to do different things or if you're doing contradictory goals then you're going to get your bread getting hacked up. Uh, and in that case, you may be looking at subsites or some other strategies around that. So I think with this one, it's far better to actually see um, your goals, be like so we can actually debate um, and I'll sh bring up some good examples. So in the email that I sent out to everyone, uh, we had, um, it's good for you to have a project to work through these exercises. So if people in the chat, could um, just send me their top one goal, two goals or three goals in order. And I want, and then I'm gonna deconstruct some of them. I'm, I'm just gonna harshly go through the goals. Um, so to educate people about nuclear issues. Okay, so I don't see that that's a clear goal because why do you wanna educate people on nuclear weapons? Um, is it just because you want people to understand about a specific issue? To me, that um, isn't um, anything that we can connect to strategically. So for example, you may have something like, I want people, we want to educate people on um, nuclear issues so that they will X, Y, Z. Like, so then your goal isn't so much to educate, it'd be more, we want them to do something 
to do that, we need them educated. So they may be, for example, you, you may want to um, set up like Al Gore did, where he has all the people trained up to deliver presentations. Um, create a peer peer network for local gig workers to trade skills. Okay, so that's, so the goal would be there, um, you want local gig workers to sign up to your platform and use that to trade skills. So yes, to, it, it sounds a bit um, similar, but to create a peer peer network is one thing, but your goal of doing that is to get local gig economies to trade skills. Um, to promote the human side of my local businesses. And again, I'd say that that's quite a vague goal. Like, why are you doing this? Um, what are your goals of doing this? Like, what is your thinking and motivation for promoting the human side of your local businesses? Um, to keep people updated on your campaign. Why do you care if people updated on your campaign? Uh, in that context, your goal would be to get people to act on your campaign or maybe to share or to lead fundraise. Um, develop a data, mate, mine database. And that. So back to my original point, something um, like the goals of your project is actually much more complicated than you think. Um, develop a data roadmap for project, data management and governance. That doesn't quite make sense to me. Data collection. So number two is we want to collect details on people, I assume without knowing the project. So that is a clear goal. We want to collect people's details. And data insights and visualizations. I'm assuming that then you want to be able to target those. To keep update on our campaign. Um, Okay, to make a website that I can minister to yourself is not a digital goal. That'd be your personal goal. Um, make people go to your to buy my books. Okay, so your number one goal is to sell books. Um, get a community on board with local council to climate emergency. To get local council to declare a local community. Okay, um, so to get the community on board with the local council. And to get local to collect, that is your campaign strategy. That is what your campaign is trying to do. Now, a website by itself is just not going to get the local council to declare a climate emergency. Like it's not, people aren't magically going to go to the site and then go, yes, we're going to declare it. There's going to need to be some sort of ca um, campaign, strategic work on targeting specific um, councillors, for example. So what under that campaign strategy so that, that's your campaign goals. Then you need a campaign strategy. And then under that, how would your website support that? So if you want the local council to declare a climate emergency, maybe it's something where you can get information for councillors or maybe where councillors can sign up. Or maybe there's a, um, you want local residents sign up so then you can get them to come to an event. So in that case, your goal would be to get um, local signups um, to get them to an event. Um, motivate people, that's very vague. Goals to the project, engage people, join the making of media, Cropia. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump through a bit quicker. Okay, inform union members about JobKeeper. Activate union members around JobKeeper and utilize activated members to recruit new members. Again, this is more a campaign strategy, not specifically what is the actual website trying to do. So to translate that would be, activate union members, would be to get union members to sign up. Um, you would inform, provide information, and then provide um, act, action points for them to do. Okay, mobilize 3.5 of the population to participate in as well civil disobedience. Again, that's campaign strategy. Um, deliver online consultations to women for hormone balancing. Um, yeah, that's close. 
local people to make action. Local people to take more action. What does that mean? All right, so I'm going to uh, wrap that up because uh, I could go for quite a while. But the point is we want very clear goals on what your website wants to do. Um, and where, so you, you want your, your bigger picture organizational goals and organizational strategy, then you want to know what your actual goals are. So for example, um, and it should be quite clear. Um, goal of this website, I mean, internet slow because of the webinar that's running is to get people to sign up to the webinar. That's it. My goal, number one goal is to get you to sign up to the webinar. My number two goal is to trickle um, some leads for work, but clearly number one goal, sign up for webinars. So this should be very simple. I want people to do this. I want them to buy a book. I want them to sign up. I want them to do this very clear, short goals. Um, let's scroll down. Okay, so the last one was to induct people into working groups. Yes. Um, uh, targeting to do one month to, to document. Okay, targeting Victorian suburbs, town and inner city groups to join other local together. Okay, so no, you want people to, to, to volunteer to pick up rubbish. Okay, here we go. This one here um, from Holly. To get people to see online virtual reality film. Yes, bang. We want people to see this video. That is the number one priority. Then number two, they want to get an email sign up to pass on to partner organizations. So that's an action. And provide a download or educational resources back for us. So that, that is really good. One, two, three. We're very clear of what we want the people to do. Now, on top of that, they would have a campaign strategy of why they want people to see the film, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna keep moving. Um, and I, uh, just before I jump forward, I, I really urge you to, um, of all the things of, uh, that I'll go through that you may see that's relevant or not relevant to what you're doing, this is essential to anything. Um, from all my experience, if you don't have clear cut goals, then your website will go to mush. And um, you, your website, it will, it will be, your, your efforts will be luck if it works. If you've got very clear goals and you're set on that, then you can then do the work to make them work. Okay, here we go. Sign up to platform, number one. That is the goal. Yes, that is correct. Shift local spending habits to local spending. Um, sort of. That, again, is back to campaign strategy. All right. Current audience. Um, target audience. All right, so this concept, um, hopefully a lot of you have seen uh, in recent recent times. Oh, actually, I'm gonna actually break, is there any questions on that? While we're, because um, I think goals are so important before I jump into the other stuff. No, I'm hoping that makes sense. Okay, good. All right. So target audience. So this is um, sort of marketing 101. So a lot of people should be familiar with this. But this is who do you want to talk to? Um, and that's very important to define who you want to talk to. So back with the Swiss Army knife of communications. So I've got I've come across people that said, who do you want to target with your project? They're like everyone. I want everyone in Australia to do this, or I want everyone in the suburbs to do this, or I want everyone in Coburg to do this. And so what you're creating there is a Swiss Army life of communications. It's very vague and rather than if you've got targeted communications. So here's an example. If you had a 54 year old male, he lives in the city. So if you could just think about a stereotype of that individual. Um, versus a 14 year old alternative gender person who lives in regional Australia. If you think about how they talk and how they communicate and um, talk amongst their friends, 
it's going to be very quite differently and to the point where the latter I would um, struggle to communicate um, to be able to write comms for because I'm just so detached from that uh, audience that I would struggle with that. So if we've got a very targeted um, audience, say the 14 year old in regional Australia, then we can actually, I can go, okay, so strategically, I actually need some help to be able to do the comms. I need to be able to get someone that can talk to them. Versus, um, you know, 54 year old male. Uh, um, so what we're wanting to look at in our target audience is what their desires and fears are. There's a, a marketing saying that if you can understand their desires and fears, you can sell them anything. Um, so we're really wanting to look at what motivates people. And within the target audience, we may be looking at subcultures, um, what sort of language they're using. And later on, once we get into um, targeting, when we get into Facebook advertising, we can get very specific targeting. It also um, allows us to look at social media platforms. So for example, different audiences use different platforms and there's hundreds of social media platforms. Young people are generally starting to move into subcultures on platforms. So if you can't even define who you're talking to, you can't then have a conversation about what platforms to, you, to even target them on or how to talk to them. So you may produce um, a very dull, um, looks like the government made it, Facebook ad, and then wonder why nobody's clicking through. Um, because you're probably talking to a very generic audience and it's just not resonating with anyone. So even if you've got, uh, even if your audience is to, you know, you want everyone converted. So you want everyone in Australia to do a thing. So at that point you might go, well, let's just be a little realistic and say, well, this group of people just aren't, they just don't care about our stuff. This group of people, yeah. And then, so even in that context, you can then um, start chipping away until you can start getting some definition on the audience. Okay, current audience. Now the reason I put current audience versus target audience is that you may, a lot of people get confused about who they are currently, who's their current audience to who their audience wants to be. So if you're um, selling um, business services and you've got a, a sort of a small business target, you may want to, you may want to then sell to a quite a different audience. Uh, and you may want to change your business. You may be currently talking to, you know, the lefty um, socialists in Brunswick, um, which all agree with you, or you might go, I'm actually going to target a different audience. Um, so the audience that you're targeting may be different to the current audience that you have. So it's very important to um, define what audience you have versus what audience you actually want to target. And a lot of people in organizations, they like to do what they know. So therefore they will um, just want to say that their target is the current audience. Um, however, strategically, that's not always the way. Okay. I'm going to, to drop to questions. Um, does anyone have any questions they want to type onto the Zoom um, chat or? Okay, so if you have questions along the way, um, just drop them into the chat. Because uh, I'm going quite well for time. So I'm going to keep going. Uh, what platforms watch PPA? Yeah, that's later in the agenda. So um, we'll, that's another webinar. Okay, network mapping. This is um, something that uh, people just do in their head, um, but I'm going to just describe the formal process a little bit more. Um, and maybe I'm just gonna jump down to the council example. So I have some friends that supply a Pacific software solution to councils. Um, I won't publicly say the the application so they for them to sell their services they need to talk to specific people within the council so what they have do is they work out what council they're targeting and they have on their wall um, sticky notes and um, 
pens and arrows, they've mapped out the entire council, all the people that work for the council, what their positions are, all that sort of stuff. And so then they are looking at like, who are the people that they want to um, meet or to um, get at the table to talk about their services. So if they have a meeting with anyone in the council or they know of somebody of their friends that are in the council, then they will then look at, look at their network map and then be able to strategically say, right, well, we can have a meeting with them and then they're connected to these people, which we could get a meeting with them to get a meeting with them. Um, so they can strategically understand how the council works. Now, as they're starting to have meetings with different people and start getting in there, then they can also start learning about the politics and how power actually works. So in systems, power flows aren't necessarily what they appear at the top. Um, so then they, they can um, then start working out the politics and that then helps them a lot when um, they're pitching for the actual process because their original guess on how that system works may be quite different. Um, I'm just gonna just jump back to a question. Can we define the audience based on their concerns rather than age demographic? Definitely. Um, however, you want to, however you want to define your audience, um, as long as there's something that could be useful. So concerns is actually a great, or ethics or values is a good way of putting it as well, versus age demographic. But age demographic is important because people still use different language. All right, so uh, if you're lucky enough to have a spare wall in your house or office, um, a wall's great, sticky notes. Um, you can pretend you're the FBI and um, have one of those things you see in the movies. The other approach is to use software like MindMeister, and there's a link to it there, um, which is uh, mind mapping software. So um, that's a very useful way of doing um, those relationship types um, layouts digitally. I'm more of a link nerd, so I use Digo, um, which is basically um, a links um, research management um, system. Uh, there used to be a software called Delicious, which managed links very well. And it's quite weird that in today's age, there's not a lot of options for link managements. Uh, I tend to do my network mapping via, via website links. So it might be, you know, these, these organizations are categorized as potential allies, or these people have the skills, or these people have the ethics, and then I'd be categorizing them. Um, so I'm in the process of doing that faction skills. Um, I used to run um, Australia's largest link library um, many years ago. Um, and then I ran a link library just for uh, creatives working for positive change. So that's sort of my geek side. So I'll be releasing um, some network mapping on action skills um, when I get there. All right, so different parts of a network. Influencers are big, that terms come quite uh, common uh, in the language. Um, quite, I'm just testing the chat, testing chat. Yeah, chat's working. Okay, so, um, so influencers have become a, a common um, term. Now I'm going to use it quite a little bit differently to Instagram. So an Instagram influencer is somebody who's built up an audience and generally you've got more of like a TV celebrity or a sheep um, scenario where they go, this is a cool product. And then everyone goes, yeah, that's cool. Let's buy that product. By influencers, what I mean is people that actually have power within a system. Um, and a lot of influencers aren't public. Um, they might be the town gossip, for example. And if you are doing a campaign in a small town, um, the, one of the things that if you're moving to that small country town to um, start a campaign, the first thing that I'd recommend is find out who the town gossips are, because they're actually the influencers and the, um, the nodes of the community where they, they're controlling the information flow. Um, and they will also twist and um, adapt the messaging. So in that case, you really want to have them on your side. Uh, influencers um, can mean a lot of things, but that's extremely important because you want to know who um, who who you want to help target to help you. If you can get influencers on your side and for your message, um, then that's that's really going to be helpful. Uh, and nodes, I mentioned, uh, 
where um, where um, influencers' information will go into a certain point, and then um, that influence flows. So town gossips was an example, um, and there are other other examples if you start mapping it out. So you're sort of looking for um, areas or things or um, events or anything that where um, you've got um, influence that is flowing. Um, by communities, um, we're talking, um, communities can mean quite a lot of things. They could be a football team, a football AFL. Um, they could be a local community. They could be a school community. Um, yep, so that, you're, so in that context, if you're um, doing, say, a, a campaign on um, permaculture, um, so you may be looking at like what communities would be interested in, in that campaign. Um, so schools that have gardens, for example, or um, gardening groups, et cetera, et cetera. Organisations, so that's obviously organisations that are um, related to what you're doing um, or organising around what you're doing. Uh, allies are people who will potentially work with you. Um, so they have the same, uh, they're working on the same cause or a similar cause or have the same set of values or ethics. That's very interesting with allies when, uh, when you do that in practice. Um, working on action skills, I've, um, I've contacted um, a few people I've identified or organisations that I identified as allies and they've seen me as competition. So they've got this competition mindset. I've come to them with a collaborative mindset and they've um, rejected, ignored or pushed me back because they simply see that they've got the influence in that community and they don't want another player. Um, we can talk about that strategy later, um, but it's still important for me to connect with those because eventually you'll get, excuse me, <coughs> Eventually you'll get um, people that are, will actually have a collaborative um, approach and then we'll work with you. By platforms, we're looking at what platforms people are using. So does your target audience work on Facebook? Is your target audience using online forums? Is your audience using TikTok, et cetera? Um, and also by platforms, I'd also be looking at things like, you know, Pacific groups, so like a Pacific Facebook group, a Pacific, um, and there are so many Facebook groups these days, LinkedIn groups, that sort of stuff. So um, where are your network, what platforms um, and Pacific groups on your platforms is your audience using? Uh, and also, even though we're talking about digital, uh, offline is really important um, because uh, the whole point, in my, in my opinion, of most digital um, most is to um, get people to do something offline. Um, so have a look at how your offline communi communities, um, or so for example, a conference um, of your, your community is a key one. So in um, digital activism, there's two key conferences that are um, in Australia that um, I would go to. Um, okay, so targets. So here's where you start prioritizing a list of people who or organizations or groups that you are going to prioritize. So when you're doing your network mapping, if you spend a lot of time on this, it just gets massive. So at that point, then you're starting to prioritize who you're going to um, target. Um, now, also, if you look around your just your personal um, networks and um, hobby and all that sort of stuff, um, then you'll be surprised about how many people um, are in your communities, just in your local networks that are relevant. Now, because you've got a personal relationship with them, or if you've got a hobby in common or something like that, then that would allow you to connect with those people a lot easier. Um, and I'll give an example. This is a celebrity example, so it doesn't quite translate, but it'll give you an idea. So David Pocock is the ex-captain of the Australian Wallabies, uh, which is uh, the, I think, rugby Olympic team. Anyway, I'm not, not that into the rugby, but he, he was the Australian captain of one of the main rugby teams. Um, he uh, also locked onto some machinery in the lead campaign um, and shut down the mine. 
So he was quite uh, unique as a um, football player to actually make a stand like that. And he, later on, um, I'm assuming that he's, he's thought about like how could he actively um, campaign on climate change. Now, he, if you follow that link, you'll see an article about him starting an organisation and starting to get his personal football friends um, that he, he has personal relationships with to start campaigning on climate change. And I feel that's a really powerful campaign because if there's one, one community that lefties are really um, poor at um, communicating with, and that's the sports crew. And the sports communities are massive. Um, so that campaign um, by David looking at his personal networks and who he can influence through those is actually gonna be a huge, um, huge impact. Competitors, um, so, so these are outright people you're competing against. Um, they, and we can learn a lot from them. So if I'm doing a commercial um, project, I'm always doing, a, I always do a competitor analysis because you want to, um, you want to work out what they're doing well, what they're doing badly. And um, if they're doing something really well, you may want to either copy that or do your version of it and things that they're doing badly, then that's a great opportunity for you to jump in and be able to do something better than the competitors. Um, I always have a um, mindset that a competitive approach is always far better than a competitive approach. A collaborative approach is far better than a competitive approach. So in that case, if you're commercial businesses and you start working together, you can actually create more, um, more um, work or, or more influx that you both can then share. Um, and when we're campaigning, it's quite interesting in the the um, environmental campaigning, how um, so many organizations are competing against for funding, for audience, um, you know, we're, we're campaigning in this forest and da da da. And um, I'm really hoping that we can see a lot less competition, a lot more um, collaboration. Um, okay, so I've got here, some people are using the Q&A that goes straight to Glenn Direct. Um, no, I'm using the chat at the moment. Um, but uh, you can um, ask questions on the Q&A. All right. Um, we are going really well for time. Okay, so character personas. Okay, so we've defined who, we've got our goals, we've defined who our audience is, we've now mapped out our network, so we know where our audience is. Now we wanna talk about character personas. And what the whole point of character personas is humanizing the data. So an example um, is that last year, or I read about the big NGOs saying that email is dead. They uh, saw heaps of blog posts about it. They were saying um, that people have stopped using email um, as a campaign tool, it's now dead and we need to find alternatives. Now, what was actually happening is that they were treating their audience like data and thrashing the hell out of their databases with lame data-driven asks and various things, mostly asking for money, which totally disengaged the audience. And then the audience just jumped, just started ignoring them. And then they saw that reading the data that they were um, lo losing um, that medium. So for me, email is not dead. It is for some target audiences, but generally it's not. It's because they stopped thinking about the people and they had huge data sets and they were purely looking at the data. And um, they were tweaking that data so well that they just lost it. Um, so character personas for me are an extremely important process to humanize data. Um, there's some other uh, examples here um, by some other people. These are more, um, coming from very uh, advertising um, constructs. Um, and this is like quite a full on um, example of it. Uh, so that's what the big end of town are doing. Now to do character personas, what a big corporation would do is they'd spend, uh, you know, $100,000 on advertising, I'm sorry, um, research 
and they'd pay a, a company to actually compile this. So they'd do interviews, um, uh, you know, look at data, get data sets in, et cetera, et cetera, and compile this. Now in that context, assuming you don't actually have that budget, you want to first, um, you want to first use educated guessing. Um, or you want to start using stereotypes. So within your target audience, you probably know somebody already that fits a stereotype. Or maybe you might want to um, make it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually create um, a person. So normally you, you'd make multiple characters, depends on how complex your, um, you, who your targeting is. Um, so in that case, what you want to do is you want to actually put their age, their gender, demographics, how they dress, um, and so you want to write a character. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on this and just again shoot um, shoot um, in the chat some character personas. So this will take a little bit of time. Um, so. If you, it's much easier if you know somebody in your target audience and then you can just describe them. So give them a name and you may change that name from your friend. Um, so for example, if you're talking about a uh, um, Psytrance festival, you might um, go, you know, this person's 30, um, they've um, like, they wear these sort of clothes. Um, sorry, I should have prepared one. Um, They've, they've got a job working for council. Um, they're quite respectable at, in their um, work, but then they'll let loose at the party, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what I wanna do is if you um, start, we'll do this as an exercise, is actually to just describe one of the people that your um, stereotypes or one of your character personas are. And then we'll do what we did in the last exercise, so we'll start, start creating, creating some of them. Now, this, why are you doing that? Um, I'll just also comment the fact that the reason that personas are so important is because when you're starting to debate about various ideas and things that you're doing, um, you can go, Joe would think that's cheesy. Why would you, um, why would you use that type of meme? Or, um, we want to spend some money doing this fancy photo show. You go like, would, would Joe actually, Joe think this is, this is dumb. You know, okay. So what would Joe want to do? So, um, when you're writing your email copy, um, it's cause you're not going to thrash your database. You're going to think about people. You'd be like, well, what would Joe think about this? Like Joe actually just wants to get involved in something and you're asking him for money. Like, why are you asking for money when he, Joe just wants to come along and get involved. So how about we like get him involved rather than asking for money? And how can we get him involved, for example? So if you could write down some, um, some personas and shoot them through the um, chat. Okay, so these examples coming through. Now, isn't it far more of an interesting concept to say, will Helen, or Mia or Tom like our website? What will they think about this website? Because um, it's really important to frame how you're designing and prototyping is not what you care. Like we don't actually care what you think about your website. We care about what Maya thinks of the website. We think about what Tom thinks about the website. So then when we're um, talking about various activities, we can then talk it from Tom's point of view. Uh, I've noticed the bigger the org gets, the much more complex um, their decisions become in context where they just are making stupid decisions. So even like I was working with a big org the other week and they chose this really long lame domain name and I'm like, why would you, they're like, why do you want such a long domain? And then they go, oh, well, that's because it's on brand and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, They've, somebody um, up above has made this set of rules um, and now they're applying those rules down the chain, but then they haven't stopped to think about what the users would think about that. And so I was, I was trying to um, talk to them and say, well, you know, your audience would look at it this way and they're like, oh yeah, but they're the rules. 
so um, they end up having a really stupid domain. Um, but in that context, like even if you're talking about what the domain name is, like what would Jessica think of that? Um, graphic design, language, um, platforms, all those things. So I really, um, and, and then we could also have debates, like Tom, 50 year old male, um, liberal voter, doesn't believe in climate change. If your goal is to get him to support climate change, well, he may not even use a website. Um, so if we're talking about website design, then maybe that's a different conversation. So it really gives us something to debate. So well done everyone with those examples. It's usually um, the opposite. We um, usually flow with the goals a bit more and then struggle with the side of it. Um, so we've had the opposite here, so that's really good. So I'll leave it at that because I think you, you, this group gets it quite well. Um, and um, I'm hoping that you're getting the, uh, that we're resonating with the point, and I've lost my windows now, that um, we really want to humanize the data um, and humanize the process. Okay, and now we can also start talking about what I mentioned before. So what keeps them up at night? What is their desires? What is their fears? Um, so Jessica, a three-year-old parent of a small child, works part-time, roller derby. So what is her desires and her fears? And then how does that sink in with what you're trying to do? Um, so yeah, normally the big corporations have um, very fund, um, funded research. What we've done here is we've just done an educated guess. Um, but in saying that though, you can also do a lot more. Um, for example, you can look at your demographic on your Facebook page. Um, if you've got a Facebook page, it has quite a lot of data on who your people are. And for me, it's testing. So if you're having an event, I'd be really interested in who's coming, um, you know, talking to the people, start getting to know your audience. Um, because in life, we all make a lot of assumptions about people and it's very important to start learning your audience as much as you can. Okay, so now that we've got um, our people, that, that exercise sort of fitted a little bit outside of what we're doing, um, but it's sort of the only place we could fit it. So the next, next bit is off on a tangent, but then it does, it will jump back. So now we're gonna create the journey. And this is the journey of the people now, our personas. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is campaign phases. I'm going to open up all these websites. So when we're talking about our goals, back to the start, these can change quite a lot, um, depending on what you try and chew and once you achieve goals. So for example, um, right now I've done a soft launch on action skills. My number one goal is to um, get people to sign up the webinar. Um, my campaign strategy on that is to build brand and then also to build content, which I'll be using later. Uh, once um, I'm past this phase, I'll be looking at a launch. And so my goals and this website will be completely different. So I'll be rebuilding this website. Um, however, in that context, I'm using an um, approach called Agile um, Rapid Development. So you'll notice there's no pictures on my website because I've simply done the minimum website that I could build to get this launch, to get the webinars going. Um, this isn't my final website. I'm at the, at the prep part of the um, phase. So it's also important to see where, where your phases and streams are. And I like to, in this context, to use a garden analogy. So where uh, we notice with uh, isolation, a lot of people are now taking up gardening, which is great to see. So the thing is you need to prep your garden. So you get it in, in preparation. So that's sort of where I'm at. Um, then you put your seedlings in and then they're growing and then the harvesting. So your campaign will be going through different phases and your websites and your other digital marketing is gonna to need to change to that. So if you've got a very um, rigid plan, marketing plan, and then six months later, um, somebody's breaking the rules, it's um, maybe, because that 
that's out of date. Like the campaign doesn't work like that anymore. And then in a garden, it's interesting because we also have annuals and perennials. So some of the things that we do are short-term things. We may run a, a campaign to support something short-term, or these may be something that we're building over a couple of years. Um, so this is the um, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, 2007. Um, so they, um, I was working with some friends on nuke stuff. Um, hang on and I'm not sharing my screen, apologies. Let me jump to that. I'm looking at it and I'm wondering why you can't see it. Share screen. And that also would have meant that you wouldn't have seen the other stuff I was looking at, so apologies. Oh, share screen. Share. Oh, that's the wrong one. Stop share. Sorry for the tech fail. Share screen. New. Okay. Here we go. Confirm now. Let's my browser gone. Oh, I lost my browser. Here it is. We are there. All right. Apologies. All right, so we started with um, the idea to ban nuclear weapons. Big call. Um, so they had some campaign strategy um, to do that, and we were doing the digital. So our initial strategy was that this, all the sort of communications and um, everything going out about weapons was very um, doomsday, death, negative, um, over the top, impossible big it's a really awful subject so we're like well if we're showing pictures of like awful stuff people are going to disconnect so we originally put this uh, more positive um, design we've got the clouds um, we got a nice illustrator in to do our illustration um, and we produced a really small simple um, brightly colored website um, to launch it which worked really well um, we got launched. Then a couple, um, oh, how much was it? Eight months later, some friends come to me and say, oh no, Tim's just like damaged your website. He's like deleted it and built another website. So Tim was the campaign manager at the time. And I looked at him and that's great. And they're like, what do you mean? He's just deleted your beautiful website and replaced it with this. I'm like, yeah, because the, the old website was a child. and its aim was to, to start walking. Now the campaign's actually grown and that website was useless. It wasn't able to, wasn't able to walk. So Tim built this website, which was, um, which is now um, starting to be able to run it as a campaign. And you'll notice um, in the old way of design that we just throw everything in there and hope for the best someone can find it. Okay, so this is in um, 2018. Um, and you can see that the campaign's getting a lot more mature, a lot more slicker, um, and simplifying the messaging. Uh, this is the latest one that they've just done. Now, you'll notice the, the change in this is that, what, that what, is, what do they want you to do with this website? They want you to sign up. So we've gone from, so what would have happened, they would have got some fancy consultants and strategists to come in um, and just told them to simplify it. Okay, so the number one goal is I'm in, the second goal is to watch, and the third goal is to donate. Um, and then they get down to business here. Um, so you can see how the campaign has gone through different phases and that and it's doing different things. Um, the earlier phases was more about getting influential people involved. Um, it was more um, academics, um, mayors, that sort of stuff. Um, now I think they're um, shifting their strategy. I'm not actually sure what they're doing, but my assumption is they're trying now to get a mass movement of people to support that other work. And I, I'm making that assumption because I see it's quite clear what their goals are. 
And if you've got clear goals, they should be clear to everyone. And that's the point we want to have very clear goals. Now, um, now that the um, campaign that was born in Melbourne has gotten too big for its little hometown, they have now built um, another website, which is for the Australian audience. So um, this has a different strategy and now they can target a different audience in a different way, even though it's part of a bigger campaign. So they're still getting people to sign up to the main thing, but it just allows for them to have much more targeted audience and much more um, uh, efficient with their bread knife. Now, this is also a new approach to web development that I've been doing and um, which you will be able to do if you follow all of my webinars, not just plugging it, is that this is based Divi on top of WordPress. And I spent a few hours teaching Jem how to use Divi. Um, now Jem who runs this campaign uh, runs her on veg oil. So I figured that she could learn websites easy enough, which she did. She pretty much built the website and then I fixed up some of the easier bits, gave her a bit more training. So my models have shifted from building websites to helping other people build websites because the technology has shifted. So even my business approach is changing in, in streams. So for um, ICANN to still be using this website is not too cool. Um, so we do want to be looking at what are our streams. So you can pre you can um, pre-plan some of your streams, but generally you may be only looking at this. So when you're, um, if you've got people in your organisation that um, that um, are saying, oh, but looking at future goals or future things we're trying to achieve, you uh, may be able to talk to them and say, well, we're doing this in the short term, we'll run this for six months, then we're gonna to shift to this. Um, in the old days, websites were really expensive to build. And so you're sort of stuck with it for two, three years. Now we can rapid prototype these websites really quickly and cheaply. So that means you might go, well, we're gonna have this website for four months, then we're gonna have this website for four months, then for two months we're having this website. Um, yes, these things still take work, so you don't do that willy-nilly, and you definitely wanna be strategic with what you're doing. But the point is that you've, um, you plan your website for your, for your streams. Okay, so, um, so with action skills, we've done a soft launch. We're going to launch in a different way before COVID. Um, so I've pivoted. Um, so we're just doing a soft brand awareness at the moment, just getting the brand out there um, and building content. Um, and then we're gonna again have a quite different website when we launch. Beautiful. All right, service design. Now, this is a concept that should be um, a lot more um, in the main um, vocabulary as um, the word influencers, for example. Um, but service design for me is the key in making a successful um, digital campaign. If you don't have your service design um, really tight, then you'll, um, it just, you'll get so much drop off. So I saw a consultant recently that had a shopping cart to book their, their consultancy services. And when I went through the process of purchasing that, it felt just really weird that I was being, it was being, it was like a product and that then it was also a clunky um, system. So I've recommended to them to actually put in an actual um, scheduling software so that a user can come and go, I want this consultant's time, I want it for two hours, I want it on this date. Um, click that, pay the money, and it's done. Okay, so I'm going to just read off this. This, this is the uh, Wikipedia definition. Service design is the activity of planning and organizing people, infrastructure, communication, and material components of a service in order to improve its customer quality and the interaction between people and service providers and its customers. So in the next dot point, I've just cut that back down so it's not just a mouthful. We're planning the components of a service to improve quality of interaction. So I'll distill it even more, is that we wanna make a better service for your people. If you want people to sign up, you wanna make it as easy and as efficient as possible to sign up. 
Um, so digital service design, and I've grabbed that same Wikipedia description. So service design within digital. Infrastructure, so in that case, we're talking about assets, digital assets, so website, blog, social media. And um, communi our communications, so that's our publishing, our conversations on social media, and our material, which is content. So it's exactly all the same concepts um, we're just putting on a digital construct. Now digital, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat what I said before. Digital is a subset of organizational strategy. And offline may be key to what you're trying to do and not even service design. Oh, sorry, not even um, part of the website. And something that goes across, um, across the board, in whatever you're doing is old fashioned service. So by what I mean by that is that the, um, it's more of a stereotype for older people, uh, for the younger people listening, is that when you go into a shop, there's a friendly person, they'll chat with you, like ask them questions and they'll help you out. And then um, they'll know you by name, they'll know your favorite orders, those sort of things. So when you're looking at any system, you want to like, how is this going to be a positive experience for them? If you want them to sign up to um, this database, um, what, what, how can you facilitate that? So um, let's just have a look at this, how this is gonna work. Yes, we've got one goal, okay. Um, I'm in. Okay, so I get to fill out this, sign up, bang, that was easy. So it's a very simple. So um, our service design will though come back far more steps. Like how do I even get to this website? So we got to this website because I was using it as an example. So that definitely wouldn't be their service design. But um, are they doing Facebook ads, for example? Are they doing um, posters at rock concerts that then are gonna have a link to get people to there? All right, so I'm going to, um, now interchange some other language, which is um, service, which is user journeys and pathways. And this is um, a subset of service design. Um, and so I'll talk to this a bit and then I'll jump back to digital um, service design. So I'm gonna jump to um, out, um, real life examples like offline examples because um it makes a little bit more sense um and for homework i want you to um deconstruct service design in your life forever for the rest of your life um it's something i sort of do as a hobby like if i'm in a situation if i'm in a situation and I, i'm doing something yeah, um, in, in a constrained construct, like I'm from a shop or if I'm, um, you know, doing something, I will always be deconstructing how that was designed. I'll be thinking to myself, how am I behaving and how am I feeling about it? Um, in positives and also negatives. Um, so I'm going to give you two examples. Um, and these are um, supermarkets. And the reason that I use supermarkets um, is because we are all, all have been to a supermarket. And I really urge you that next time you go to the supermarket, uh, hopefully you do it for the rest of your life, but at least once go to the supermarket. I wanted you to deconstruct the, um, deconstruct the um, experience. So for example, and I'm gonna use Woolworths, when you first go into the shop, what the first part that you walk into, actually I might just jump off the share. Um, so the, now I've lost my notes. There. Okay, so the first bit that you walk into when you're going to Woolworths is the fresh food and coals. So the vast majority of what, what the supermarkets sell is um, dry goods, um, they're actually not the fresh food people by any stretch of the imagination. The vast majority of what they sell is processed and packaged food. Um, now, everybody subconsciously or consciously knows that fresh food is better for you. 
So they want to portray a good wholesome um, image um, and a good wholesome experience. Like even if you're buying really unhealthy and crap products, they want you to feel like you're, you're um, doing the right thing and eating healthy. So the first thing when you go into a Woolworths is that you'll go through the fresh fruit aisle and all the, all the stuff. That will give you the first impression of how you feel in that store that's healthy and all that. Um, there's a great video here, um, which is um, Milk in the Back. Um, I urge you to watch this. And this talks about the psychology of, um, of the supermarket layout. So basically they put the milk in the back. So that means that you walk past the healthy stuff, you go through all, all the aisles before you get the milk. Then they'll put your other um, staples, say the bread, somewhere opposite in the store. So then you've got to walk all through the store and then you end up buying the Coke, buying the chips, buying all the other stuff. Now this is very deliberately designed to make you go through the shop. Um, I, were, I worked near a, um, a, a petrol station uh, many years ago and they um, completely stripped their entire um, shop and redesigned it and what they did is just move the doors. The old layout had the doors where the checkout was. So you walk past the part, you walk, fill your car up, you go into the doors and you pay your money. What they did is they rebuilt the entire store to put the doors at the back of the store. So you had to walk past all the products before you um, paid for your fuel. Uh, and then you also notice once you get to um, the, okay, so also when you're walking through the aisles, they're playing that music and that thing bugs me the most. It's like they're playing their jingle that they had on TV that's reinforcing their messaging. Um, and then you get to the end of the um, process and while the aisles at the checkout have got all the impulse buy stuff so you end up buying some chocolate and stuff and then the thing um, some other things I really want you to look at when you go to that shopping center the, the supermarket is the lighting um, and there's a video here that you can watch again um, is basically if you go to the meat section they all use lighting which has a higher red wavelength what that does is make the meat look redder because um, the psychological studies have shown that people want red meat not brown meat so they actually make it more red you go into the fruit and veg section and they're using higher green um, wavelengths so that's making things look fresher and um, nicer so how many times have you looked in a shop and you've bought something that looks really nice and then when you get home you go oh that doesn't look as good they've used lighting tricks to to get you on that um, you go um, into the cosmetic section and they've got these hyper lights which are making all that really expensive packaging ping out. Uh, and then there's another one, um, if you want to read this report where um, companies are researching how to make children nag you to buy products. Um, I came across once a conference was actually on that. There was a marketing conference um, and their aim was how to make children nag so you can sell more. So that entire system has been designed to make you feel good while buying um, less than healthy products and spending as much money as possible. So when you're in that, when you're in, in that environment next, deconstruct how you're behaving, how you're feeling about it. Um, so back to more the glam shopping malls. Shopping malls are, are built um, in using a lot of the old um, old um, approaches of cathedrals. And cathedrals are built to make you feel overwhelmed by the glory of God. Um, and cathedrals are designed in a similar way um, to make you feel um, dis disassociated so that you're not thinking normally and rationally as you normally would you're a bit more in a dream state so you're you're more likely to buy stuff all that's totally designed air conditioning levels um layouts um to the point where even in something like uh, a more where it's ideal air conditioned um there's no wear and tear they will actually um replace shop fitting every five years because they want to create that fantasy which then makes you want to buy more all right so i'll jump to another example um, McDonald's, um, so I'm just, let's just all assume here you eat there. Um, and I know a lot of the audience wouldn't. 
Um, so here's a service design um, example. We, um, it's six o'clock and I'm, I'm really keen I'm gonna still cook dinner. Um, I'm watching TV and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna cook dinner. Then there's this ad from McDonald's comes on, um, you know, they're slick advertising and you're like, hmm. Then you think about your journey to work and when you drove past um, and you go like, and then you, you flash back to what you saw when you drove to work. And that was uh, the, just down the road, there's the, the big arches and then the store. And then you visualize, oh yeah, it's just on the road, I could just go in there. So you go, all right, I'm gonna, it's just down the road, I'm going to um, go there. So you get in your car, you drive there, you go into the um, drive-through the menu um, design is designed to overwhelm you. That's probably the most um, heavily funded design project. In, um, that is tweaked to give you a sense to just order more and to um, be quite confused with that. Um, and then there's a whole lot of design in the back end to be more efficient. And then, um, you get your food and drive off. So it's a very seamless, pain, painless um, uh, experience. That has been heavily refined. So we jump to a similar example and um, people who go into the McDonald's stores. So the mo one of the most expensive, um, one of the most expensive um, things in a McDonald's store are those staff, even though they're just 15 year old kids on minimum wages. So McDonald's now is looking at how do you phase out your staff? So we need service design to do that. So what they're doing now is they're using the touch screens because the touch screens are far cheaper for people. How do you get people to use touch screens? Again, you've got service design. You make that experience better than dealing with a human. Um, so build your own burger. No, it's nonsensical because McDonald's is famous for having a really refined system where there is not much choice, but they give you the illusion of choice so that then you will then buy that. Um, so you will then use the interface, which then allows them to phase out the people. Um, and the same way they're introducing the apps. Um, just don't ask about the fecal matter testing that's been done on those. So in the same way, and I do urge you, even if you don't eat at McDonald's, please go to a McDonald's store, um, but just, start deconstructing how they're making people feel, um, the processes that they're going through, and then um, to make that work. Then what we wanna do is now we start learning and thinking about service design and pathways and journeys, how we can deconstruct that for ourselves. So how, if, if you wanna get, and now we go back to our character personas, which is great. So I'm just gonna to jump to some character personas. Uh, me, a 38-year-old arts worker, what is the journey that we're going to get from her and I've ever heard about um, the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons to, to actually signing up? So, well, we need to then look at, well, where does she hang out? Like, what's, what messaging is going to resonate with her? Is she in these certain Facebook groups? What's something that... Da, 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 da. Um, okay, so... What so say that we've then um, targeted a Facebook group that's that's relevant that she may be interested in, and then what what would be something that she would actually click on to actually get to the website? Um, so that that is the um, service design that we're then designing, and there can be quite a few different journeys and pathways that we're we're um, writing. So to to translate that into digital websites. So we're now going to start designing our site maps, um, our landing pages, like what are people going to see when they land? Um, what's the functionality um, are they looking for? What sort of graphic designer are we using? What's the imagery and copy? What platforms are we using? Now with this um, pathways, once you've mapped that out, this becomes your obsession to refine it. Um, and that's what McDonald's has done and Woolworths have done, is that they've just keep refining the efficiency, keep refining the efficiency, keep refining the efficiency. And so at the moment, your first pathways and your first set of pathways and journeys are going to be an educated guess. 
Then you want to actually get feedback from people using it. You want to do some user testing and you want to work out how can I make this as efficient and streamlined and easier as possible. Um, because once you get your service design done well, then you'll be able to then um, convert as many people as possible. And then you can then focus on your marketing and trying to actually build your numbers up to convert. All right, do we have any questions on that? Um, we are talking about the website example that I use for ICANN Australia. Um, that is built on WordPress and Divi, um, which I've moved most, of, and we're doing WordPress and a lot of WordPress and Divi later webinars. So um, I'll, be able to, I'll be able to teach you how to build this website uh, quite easily, assuming you've already got the photos and logos. Um, all right, now we're going ahead of schedule. And I've got a, I'd much prefer to, to finish early because everyone's busy rather than um, pad out the content. So I'm gonna just introduce the um, central node concept. Um, sorry, the internet's slow because of my loading. All right. And if you want a higher version of it, you can go here. So this is um, visualizing a pathway structure. Um, oh, my PDF's not linking. Okay. Let me go. I'll fix this link tonight. Um, okay. So these are the same diagram. I've just visualized it differently so that you can, um, oh, screen not shared, thank you. Um, zoom, share, share, there we go. Sorry about that. All right, so we have, um, so the, these, these two diagrams are actually the same thing. And uh, we're just visualizing it differently um, to get the point across. So th this is uh, sort of a sort of framework of um, pathways in a digital context. So first thing is we want to actually get to our audience. So this is marketing um, in the traditional and also the digital sense. Like we need people to actually come across our message amongst all that um, competition out there for attention. So uh, here's some examples, paid social media, um, content curators and nodes. Um, this is a little bit out of date. That would now be called inf like influencer. So um, in an old way of looking at, these are people who are creating content and um, other people's content and they become, so therefore they may add your content and shoot it out. Uh, you may have an event store at the local school and give out flyers with your website address. Um, you may be lucky enough to get some celebrities. Um, you print some t-shirts. Um, search AdWords, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and we're going to be doing a whole session on digital marketing. Um, but digital marketing is like a whole webinar series just on that. But um, so I'm going to keep that pretty short. So basically you need to work out how to get front of your audience somehow, then you need them to do something. So in this case, we're um, gonna sign them up to a database. And again, we're um, going to be talking a lot more about databases later. Um, but you need them, you need to collect the data. So you need to do that somehow. So sign, signing up is the standard thing. So the ICANN example we saw earlier, which is we're just gonna sign them up. Um, Donation, so that is the best way, of course, because you get some money on the way. Okay, so petitions. Um, so most petitions, if not all of them that you see out there, uh, basically, mostly they don't care about the um, thing they're getting petition on. They want to get your data into the database. So if you go like sign here to save the wetland forest, then they'll get 10,000 signatures. Generally, they're ignored by the whoever they're targeting, but then they've got 10,000 people that they can talk to and then move them to do something else and do something else that would then actually 
achieve their goals and actually save the wetland forest. Um, some petitions are relevant, but um, I'm generally skeptical of them, but they're great for data harvesting. Running competitions, this is old school, um, as always effective. Um, sign up to competition. You may manually add people that you've um, collected at an event. Um, although if you're having an event, um, I recommend that you have an iPad or a tablet and you have like get them to sign up through the website. It's quite awful trying to um, type in people's email addresses and things like that. And this one is really um, used with caution. This is sharing data from other organizations. So uh, it's great, we've got strict privacy rules around this now. Um, so in that context, rather than sharing data, you might agree to send a newsletter to your data set and say, um, and say, um, say, do you want to sign up for this? And I agree, paper sign up is poor privacy protection. And I can uh, talk about some dodgy examples. Um, and there are other ways to get people in your database, um, but I do urge you to uh, think about the ethics of it. So there are a lot of technical um, considerations and legal um, examples, but what I'd really be thinking about is how would you feel if someone used your data this way? And how would Rosie feel and how would Jane, our character personas back there, feel about you using their data in that way? Because you might be quite smug and um, you know, bought, a data, bought a database, and then you send an email to someone who's already a supporter and they realize that you've just spammed them. They go, well, that sucks. I'm your organized and they disconnect from you altogether. So I'm a big believer of respecting people's data because it also come back. Okay. So the next step is you've got them in a database and you sign them up to Facebook. Like that again is very, who cares? Um, Having a big data uh, Facebook group and a big database doesn't mean anything. It's not going to help save the wetland forest. It's not going to do anything. What we need is people to actually do stuff. But the reason we want them in the wet, now we've got them in, in a system that we now can communicate with them. And um, I would say that Facebook isn't a form that you can communicate with them because you need to pay to um, communicate with the audience on Facebook. Um, and the bigger you are, the more they charge you. Okay, so then we want to then um, get people to go and do something. So we may want to get them out. I mean, it, again, this is pre-COVID and it's going to be post-COVID. But we want to get people out of their homes and off the internet. Um, so we might send them to a rally. Um, we might send them to an info event. We might send them to a party, film night. Now, I've got a space there because this is upping the ante a bit, but some people don't want to go there. They see these things as ineffective, and so they might want to then jump straight. I want to actually do something more important. So you might bring them to a planning meeting, to a workshop or training, or arts production, or something like that. Like, how can you get people involved? Because it's when you get people in person working together, that's when relationships form and you can start grow grow your campaign. But at that point, you then want to get those people into your database, but then tag to something separate. So you want to tag them as they're the people that come to stuff because then they're the people you spend more time nurturing and supporting and da da da. So then that data needs to then go back into the database. Uh, then we want to take them to the next level. You want to get them from just people that have shown up to people that are actually doing something. So they're volunteering, they're participating. They're advocating on your behalf. They're doing research for you. They're promoting, they're doing all the things. And again, you also need to know that these people, um, because they're, they're now your working teams. Um, and then the next step is leadership. So most NGOs don't want this next step because they're keen to just have people under their command. Um, most of the projects I work on, we want to actually uh, make leadership obsolete and actually replace and build more leadership. So we want to get them to the next level. So we want to give them responsibility, resources and tools, mentorship networks. And um, now leader vacuum means that sometimes when we've got someone that's ready for leadership, the people that usually lead just say, oh, I can't do it this time or I'm not doing it deliberately. And so it sort of creates a vacuum where that new person sort of needs to step up into it. And then um, we have a failure unit. So, you know, it's important as a leader that you're, you allow your leaders to fail 
um, and just don't burn them. You know, you made a mistake and then burn them. No, you actually need to support them in their failure and successes until they can grow as a leader. So this thing is the same way. But this, this um, probably um, visualizes it better as far as your website construct. So we start with our marketing, we get them to a website, you sign them up into the database. 